Today we have a great webinar by Mike Moyer. So I'm going to actually turn this over to Mike and we can get into the webinar today. Mike, take it away. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me today. Um, we're going to talk about a concept that I call slicing pie, which has to deal with how uh, startup companies divide up equity um, during the early days of their startup. It's, a, it's an area that uh, it's very important to me, and a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with it. And this is a relatively uh, unknown way of approaching it, not because they haven't been used before, because it, the, the mechanics of this type of equity split are not widely understood. So hopefully today um, we'll get through um, some of the mechanics and you can use it in your own startup. So the first question I want to pose to our listeners and anyone listening to this is why we start startup companies in the first place and why we go about doing this. What's the point of this effort? And when I think about it, you know, people think they're going to do some hard work on a concept or idea they believe in, and it's going to be fun along the way, and they're going to get a big payout later. So most people that are starting growth-oriented startup companies feel this way about their business. They know it's going to be hard. They know it's not going to be a slam dunk most of the time. Um, but they know that they're going to care about the process, and they're going to enjoy doing it. And hopefully they're going to find people along the way that they can enjoy doing the business with. Uh, along the way, and maybe they'll go public, maybe they'll get purchased, maybe they'll make a lot of money for cash flow, but whatever the, the reason, they hope that there'll be some kind of payout for their hard work later on. So this is a typical mentality of someone starting a company, um, especially a growth company. Um, but the problem is we don't know what our payout's going to be. Um, I don't know any startup companies that can accurately predict exactly what they're going to make when their company is successful. Um, it's a big, big, big unknown. So as entrepreneurs, we move with a lot of faith and we make a lot of assumptions about our business on what, what might happen, and we kind of act on those assumptions in ways that rational people in big businesses would not dare act on. Um, and when we act on those, those assumptions, we make some choices about what we think our company is going to be worth and what the different people are going to provide to that company to make it worth something. And most companies today, the vast majority, use what's called a fixed equity split. And a fixed equity split is one where you go in 50-50 with a partner. You have an idea, and you find someone who's going to help, and you say, all right, we'll split everything right down the middle. 50-50, we're going to be even partners. This is one of the most typical ways a company will start um, in today's economy. It's also one of the most dangerous. Um, but you can also do a 60-40 split, or maybe you have 80-20 split because it's mostly your idea, and the person's just doing a little bit of work, and you think it will require that much. Um, so whatever happens, you might... You'll, you'll, you'll think that we do 50-50 now, and then in the future, we'll get 50% of the rewards, whatever those rewards happen to be. And people think that's fair. But what if something changes in your startup company? What if you do all the work? You go in 50-50 with a partner, and you wind up doing all the work instead of that partner. You thought they were going to participate and be engaged in that, but they weren't. That's a very typical scenario, especially in a college, uh, an MBA setting, where student teams will get together for a quarter or two, and then They'll get jobs or move on to other things, but they, they walk out the door owning a big chunk of somebody's company. Um, what if you want to bring in somebody else? If you have to bring in somebody else, do you, your, your equity is still knowing how long it works. Do you, do you give, give up your equity, or does your partner give up their equity, or how do you calculate it? Or what if your partner wants to quit? That person, the day after you do your equity split, that person can quit and walk out the door with half your equity. Well, what if you want to quit? Is it fair that you keep your equity, or should somebody else get their equity back, or what happens in those scenarios? There's millions of things that can happen in a startup company um, that inevitably do. Startups are extremely volatile uh, places to work. They're extremely volatile activities. And the rate of change that they go through, especially during the formative months, is very dramatic. And uh, there's millions of things that can change. And a fixed equity split simply does not um, reflect the, uh, those changes. What if somebody dies in your company? This I've seen this before where the two partners be working together and a partner will die, and it might take years to realize any value. Does the 50% partner that died deserve the equity? Does their family deserve that equity in the company, even though the partner was, in it, was unable to participate in the success of the company? There's just lots of questions that need, um, we need a way of handling them. And today what we do is we go back and to renegotiate what our equity splits are. We go back to our partner and we say, listen, our equity split isn't right or we want to bring somebody else in. And there are a few activities that any business can engage in that are more damaging than renegotiation of anything. Renegotiation means we were wrong, we thought something was going to happen, and it didn't happen, so we have to renegotiate the terms so everyone's happier. And usually after that, everyone's less well off, everyone's less happy. Um, even if you get more out of negotiation, you're still 
uh, may, your partners will resent you for it. So renegotiation is one of the most damaging things you can do in your startup company. So we want to avoid a renegotiation uh, possibility at all costs. So what it boils down to when these changes happen is that things aren't fair anymore. When a partner leaves and they keep 50% of your equity, it's not fair. When it's no longer fair, it's no longer fun. So your startup becomes stressful. This, it starts becoming politicking and greedy, and people start stabbing each other in the back. And it takes the fun out of a startup company in a very real, tangible way. And in many cases, that, that lack of fun can actually destroy a, a startup company. And I've seen time and time again where the partners just decide they cannot reconcile their differences, and they split, their, they split, split ways, and the company is actually destroyed. So if it's not fair, it's not fun. And we want to keep startups fun so people will remain engaged and passionate and excited about what they're doing and changing the world. So fairness is a lot more fun. So what we need in the dynamic, in the, in the equity space, is a program of allocating equity in our startup, all, uh, allocating future profits of our startup that's perfectly fair to all participants. We want to reward people for the contributions they make in a company. In a fixed equity split, we anticipate what contributions they might make but in, there's a program that will actually allow us to reward people for the contributions they actually do make. We also need to provide ongoing motivation to continue contributing to a startup company. If we go 50-50 in a business, the minute I get my equity allocation, I've been paid. So my motivation to work can be different based on what I think is going to happen in the future. So if I think that you're going to do all the work and make the company success and I'm going to get a big payout without my help, then I won't be very motivated to work. We also need a program that will accommodate changes in the team, the makeup of the team, and a program that's flexible in the changes in the face of rapid change in the company. So as our company changes, we need to be flexible. But as people come and go in our team, which inevitably happens, we have to be able to accommodate them in a very meaningful way, a very fair way. So we need a program that does all these things. That program is called a dynamic equity split. A dynamic equity split is one that will accommodate changes in a startup company and unlike a fixed equity split, it changes um, throughout the formation stages of a company so that people can make sure that they're getting what they deserve out of the company and they don't have to make any guesses about the future. It's impossible to guess what our company is going to be worth. Even the smartest, savviest entrepreneur in this cannot determine what their company is going to be worth in the future. So we, don't, we can't base our predictions, our, our equity splits on future predictions of what might happen. We need to make, base them on what actually does happen. And a dynamic equity split allows that to, to take place. So we work now hard now, and we get exactly what we deserve later. Not sort of what we deserve, or in the ballpark of what we deserve. We should get exactly what we deserve. And the share of your reward should be in direct proportion to what you contributed. So your share of the company, your ultimate equity that you company that you get out when the company splits or, or gets, gets sold or starts distributing profits, your share of what you get should reflect exactly what you contributed to that company. If you contribute 50% of what it takes to make the company a success, you should get 50% of what the company is, what it takes to make the company a success. If you contribute 10%, you should get 10%. If you contribute 69.2%, you should get 69.2%. No rational person is going to argue with the fact that um, being rewarded in proportion to what you put in is fair. Now, lots of people would like to get a lot more than they put in, and that's what we're going for. We're, going, we're hoping that your 69.2% is worth a lot more than you, uh, your time and energy is worth a lot more than you actually put in. We want your success. But when it comes to dealing with your partners, you don't want to succeed at their expense. It's okay to be unfair with the competition. It's okay to beat the competition down, but it's not okay to beat your partners down. You want to make sure you have a program that reflects the value that everybody's bringing to the table, not just you. And in typical scenarios, that's just not the case. Because when it's perfectly fair, it'll continue being fun. When you know that you're aligned properly with your partners and investors and participants, you will continue to enjoy the company without having to suspect someone's out to get you or suspect someone that's getting more than they deserve or think somebody's being too lazy or think someone's doing more than their fair share of the work. You want things to be perfectly fair because it'll stay fun until you can have a nice exit. So the concept I want to describe to you, the execution model I want to describe is called a grunt fund. A grunt are these little animals, which are also people who are willing to do the hard work that it takes to get a company off the ground. Everything from marketing the company to cleaning the toilets to calling customers to doing the billing, anything it takes to uh, get a company off the ground is, is grunt work, and that's what grunts do. So. Most startup companies are made up of these people who are willing to do just about anything 
not in exchange for money all the time, but in exchange for some of the equity that will turn into value someday. So a grunt fund is the model that I propose that people use to implement a dynamic equity split. There are lots of ways to implement dynamic equity splits. This is my model, and your model might be different. Um, I like this model because it's very concrete, it's very fair, and it's very clear how it works. So I'm going to take you through how it works right now. The first thing you do in a grunt fund is you assign a leader that you can trust. Second thing is you, add, you, add, you assign a theoretical value to the various inputs provided by each participant. And I'll do over that in a minute how that works. And the last step is you determine someone's percentage ownership by dividing their individual value of what they contributed by the total value of what everybody contributed. And that will give you the exact percent of the shares they deserve in that company. So that's the basic calculation that works for it. So the two critical components are determining the total value of the firm and the individual value of the firm. So step number one. Get a trustworthy leader. It doesn't always go without saying you should hire only work with people you can trust. One typical scenario is that people will get into new companies and they'll do a lot of legal work up front. They'll do a lot of agreements, they'll do a lot of corporate structure and kind of butt covering legal agreements. If you have to start off with your team with a lot of legal agreements, you're probably not working with the right team. I always encourage people to hire lawyers to do implement the basics, implement the basic level of liability, corporate structures, the basic agreements. But you want to spend your money and your time and energy growing a company, not on protecting yourself from what might happen in the future. So you want to work with people you can trust. And the reason you want to trust this leader is because they will generally hold the equity until it's appropriate to issue equity. You don't have to issue equity in the beginning of a company. Most people make that mistake. It's a very common mistake to issue all the equity before the company even gets going. One person can hold on to it, and clearly you have to trust that person in order to make sure they don't rip you off. That person will manage the grunt fund and also deal with people appropriately when they leave the herd, when they leave the, leave the company. The next step is to assign theoretical values to the various inputs. Now, there are lots of different inputs that someone can provide, a grunt can provide to a startup company. The, the most popular one is time. Um, they can also put in relationships, uh, credit in the form of credit cards or small loans. Ideas are obviously an important part of a startup company. Small amounts of cash, uh, equipment like trucks and printing presses and ovens and things that make the company work. Small supplies like office supplies and equipment and laptop computers. And even facilities like uh, office space, for instance. So most of the time we think about time as our main input, but there are lots of different things that are important. And we have to have a way of assigning what I call a theoretical value. A theoretical value reflects the fact that your company in the beginning is worth nothing. Most startup companies cannot be sold at their inception. Their ideas and the basic materials cannot be sold to anybody, so their, their value is usually zero. The stock is worth zero, everything is zero. If I spend 100 bucks on a company, the company is still worth zero. If I spend $1,000 on a company, it's probably still worth zero. If I give it my great idea, it's probably still not worth anything. It's not worth anything until you can actually convince somebody that it is worth something. And you're not going to have a very good time convincing somebody that's worth something unless you have some prototypes, some customers, some, some traction, and other things that show value. So until that day dawns, your company is worth nothing. So what we need is a, rel a theor theoretical value. The theoretical value allows us to assign a value that's important, not in, in, in terms of how much it's worth, but relative to other inputs. So let me show you what I mean by that. So time is a very popular uh, uh, contribution to a startup company. So what I would do to calculate the theoretical value of time is I would figure out what your negotiated base salary. What is the base salary of someone in your position that would be paid enough that they wouldn't have to receive equity? If you just pay me for my work, you don't have to give me an equity. So I subtract any cash compensation I might receive from the company. I multiply it by two, and I multiply it by two to reflect the fact that there's a lot of risk in a startup company. There's a very big risk that I will never get paid at all. So to account for that risk, I do a multiplier of two. So anything I put at risk, my negotiated base salary, less what I'm actually getting paid, anything I put at risk, I multiply by two. And then I divide it by 2,000. 2,000 is roughly the number of hours in a year. And that gives me my grunt hourly resource rate, or DER. So here's an example. Let's say my market value is $100,000 a year. I'd be happy getting a job with no equity at $100,000 a year. And some startup guy is willing to pay me $25,000 a year. So I'm putting $75,000 at risk. So I multiply that times 2, I divide it by 2,000, and I get the grunt hourly resource rate of $75 an hour. That is a theoretical value of my time. It's not an actual value. No one's actually paying me for that. 
It's just a pretend value that will help me measure the value of my time versus somebody else's time. So uh, somebody else's time might be somebody right out of college that has no experience whatsoever. Their market rate might be more like $30,000 a year or $40,000 a year. So they'll have a lower hourly resource rate because their, the relative value of their time is less than the relative value of someone's more important or has more experience. Um, let's say I was a former senior developer at Oracle Corporation. Well, my time is much more valuable than someone who is a junior developer. So this calculation helps you keep the, those values over time and relative check. So I was getting rewarded relative to another person. So next example is money. Money, small amounts of money, are is harder to come by than time. It's much harder to save $1,000 than it is to earn $1,000. So I give it a whole higher multiplier. Instead of two, I multiply the, 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 the risk at four to give people extra reward for putting money in. Um, this is a good way to start a company. If you can just pay people, you don't have to give them equity. So the more cash you put in, the more of the company you can reserve for yourself. So this is a good way that founders can keep the company for themselves by putting cash in. It's a multiplier that I made up because based on my experience to reflect the relative value of cash in a startup company. So everything has a theoretical value. So when you have a relationship, you know, once it's a common mistake to hire someone of the big royal, uh, Rolodex and think all those relationships are going to materialize. They may not materialize into sales or investment or anything else. So I only reward those relationships when they turn into something. So I would consider an unpaid commission on a sale, for instance, times two, which is at risk, the theoretical value of that commission. For ideas, I would pay someone a royalty or the development hours of the idea plus costs as the theoretical value. For small office supplies and staplers and paper, I wouldn't give anything um, unless they were unreimbursed expenses, which I would put in a, un, as, as cash. So everything is, has a, a calculation that will help you determine how much it's worth relative to other things. Not actually how much it's worth, but what it's worth relative to other things. So your stapler that, that you paid 10 bucks for has a relative value as your hour's worth of time. So everything has a calculation. So for equipment is, is an interesting one. If I purchased a piece of equipment for the company, I would put it, treat it as if it was cash times four. If I owned the piece of equipment for, more than a, for less than a year, I would put it in as, as its purchase price as, a theor, as the theoretical value, the relative value. If I owned it for more than a year as a used piece of equipment, I would figure out how much I could buy it on the resale market and treat it as uh, the theoretical value of the actual resale value. Again, it helps assign a value to the asset or the contribution that keeps it balanced relative to other participants in the company. So on my website, slicingpie.com, I have a cheat sheet which goes over all the different calculations for all the different types of inputs. And you can download that for free off my website, slicingpie.com. If you can't find it, I will email it to you. So here is an example of how this works. Let's say you have three people in a company, a junior developer, a founder, and a rich uncle. In this case, the junior developer just brings time. They spend their hours working on a project. The founder brought equipment, brought time, and ideas to the company. And the rich uncle brought, gave the, the company some startup cap, capital, um, provided some important introductions that might turn into sales, and some credit for the credit card to help fund the company. So the theoretical base value is the, is the sum of all the different contributions. So you add up the junior developer's time, the contributions made by the uh, founder and the contributions made by the rich uncle, and that total all together gives you your theoretical base value. Again, it's not an actual value. Your company isn't actually worth this. It just gives you a base for which to determine equity splits. So ground number one share is the value of their time divided by the entire enchilada. Ground number two is the value of their time and ideas and equipment divided by the total value that contributed by everybody. And ground number three is what they contributed divided by what everybody contributed. This will give you an exact percentage that's balanced and fair given what each person contributed. So here's an example of how it might play out. Let's say the person had uh, uh, $2,000 worth of their time, theoretical value worth of their time. This is the junior developer. Number two put in $4,000 worth of their time. It could have been the name, same number of hours, but their, their hourly resource rate might be higher. Maybe a $15,000 truck and a patent that was worth $7,000. So this is the theoretical value of what they contributed. The investor might have put $60,000 in cash, and their relationships may have turned into a sale that pays a $3,000 commission. So the theoretical value of the total company at this point is $91,000. doesn't mean you can sell it for $91,000, but 
It just means that our pretend value is $91,000. When you divide it all out, it makes perfect sense. The first guy, the junior developer, would own 2% of this company. The founder would have 29% of the company. And the money guy would have 69% of the company. It's a perfectly balanced equity split given what they each contributed. And so the pie would look like this, 2% for the junior guy, 29% for the founder, and 69% for the, for, the, uh, for the investor. Now, if the founder wanted to have more control over their company and more equity in their company, they could have put more cash in. But if they didn't have the cash, they need to seek outside for the cash and reward someone appropriately for it. So let's say we bring in a new guy, a sales guy. This person has a lot of good relationships. He's going to spend some time with the company, and they bring relationships and time. The, their contribution gets added to the theoretical base value, and assuming nobody else does any more work that period, we just divide up everybody's uh, shares the same way, and the, the, the program automatically adjusts to reflect that someone else is providing contribution. So here's that sales guy now figure, can figure out how much he deserves. So here's the pie again. These three guys didn't do anything. This guy came in, spent $2,000 worth of time, landed a great big sale. So now he's added $12,000 in theoretical value. The company's now worth $103,000 in theoretical value, and the splits have adjusted appropriately. This guy, these guys have less, but they don't mind because now the company is worth more. They have a bigger, they have more important people on the, on the payroll, and the company is moving forward. So now the pie looks like this. Everyone has adjusted perfectly and appropriately given what they've contributed. So over time, people are going to get what they deserve out of a company. Now, the second problem we have with equity splits, what happens when somebody leaves? There are four circumstances under which someone could leave a company. They can be fired for good reason, meaning you didn't do your job as asked. You can be fired for no good reason, meaning you did your job as asked, but we no longer need your position, so we can't keep you on the team. You can resign for good reason, and a good reason would be like the company moves uh, a 1,000 miles away and you cannot relocate your family in a practical way, so it would be a good reason to leave the company. Or maybe the company decided to move your position to a different position that wasn't what you signed up for. That would be a good reason to leave the company. So a number of things that are good reasons to leave a company. Or you can resign for no good reason. No good reason would be you just get sick of it or you, you can't work for whatever reason or you get tired of the company or you want to take a different job or any personal reasons that aren't at fault, the company's not at fault. So each one of the circumstances brings different consequences when you become, the person de departs the company. So for instance, if you're fired for good reason because you weren't doing your job or you left the company in the lurch for no good reason, you should deserve to bear the brunt of the pain associated with leaving the company. So we would not give you any equity for the time you put into the company. We would adjust your other inputs, like the cash, without the multipliers to, to adjust those down. We would buy back anything that you put into the company in cash-wise, and we would ask you to sign a non-compete. Now, this is pretty harsh punishment for someone who gets fired or leaves for no good reason, and it should be, because if we need some retention for the company. The company can't operate if you're not doing your job or if you're leaving them in the lurch. So it's fair to require the leaving grunt under these circumstances to bear the burden of leaving the company. It's their decision. On the flip side, if you're fired for no good reason or you resign for good reason, the company is more at fault. So the company should bear the burden of your departure. In this case, you should be able to keep all the pie, all the equity you were granted. We should be able to buy it back at the full theoretical value of the company and we, the, the, the equity, and we cannot ask you to sign a non-compete because it's not fair. If we ask you to leave the company, we can't expect you not to compete if it wasn't your fault for leaving the company. So again, this is, th these are tough consequences for the company, and they should be, because we don't want to give companies an easy way out to fire people for no good reason or to change people's jobs. So when you leave a grunt, you simply subtract the contributions they made to the overall uh, theoretical base value and recalculate everyone's equity based on what the new value is. So let's say we get rid of this junior grunt. We simply subtract what he put into the company, and recalculate everybody's shares based on the departure of that person. So here's grunt number one. As you can see, we've taken out his equity. He has 0%, and everybody else readjusts. Now, they may have a bigger share of the pie at this point. It's not necessarily true that they're better off, however, because we've lost an important player, or the company has a setback when they leave, leave somebody. So just because you have a bigger percentage at that point doesn't mean you're necessarily better off. If you can avoid it, you don't want to have absentee owners on your company. It's called dead equity, and investors tend to loathe absentee owners. So the more you can put in place to buy stuff back, the better off you're going to be. And uh, I try to limit uh, the number of, uh, of absentee owners as possible. But if you have no choice, you have to deal with that as part of, the, part of doing business. Okay. 
So here's how the pie would readjust in that case. So we can see ground number one is no longer part of the company. And here's how the, the, it's adjusted. Now, if someone does continue to work for the company, let's say month one, is, the next month goes by and these, these guys continue to work for the company, their, their share will adjust based on what they work. So here's the next month. As you can see, this person's put another some more hours in, this person's put more hours in, and their shares adjust appropriately. So I'll toggle back and forth so you can see how that works. So in this case, the company's worth $101,000 in theoretical value. Everybody does more work, and boom, their equity changes based on their contribution. So month to month, day to day, um, things will change as the company uh, moves forward and builds value. There are the different points that changed. So what we've got here with the dynamic equity split is a program that adjusts perfectly. It's perfectly fair for people who are participating. Everyone's getting out exactly what they contribute. It's going to reward people for their actual contributions, not what we think they're going to contribute. It provides ongoing motivation to continue contributing because you continue earning our, uh, equity in the company. It accommodates changes in the team as people leave and come and go to the company. And it's flexible in the face of rapid change, so it can change on a dime depending on who comes and goes. And it never requires renegotiation of what anyone's worth. So eventually, though, you're going to outgrow a grunt fund. This, your company will settle down and stop changing as much and turn into a real company. And there are certain points at which you want to sort of freeze your equity and move forward under more traditional equity programs. And the case would be when the company starts generating real revenues. If you start generating real revenues, you can use those revenues to pay people, and you no longer have to give them equity. If your cash flow becomes positive, um, you can use the money to pay people. If you get a Series A investment, you can use the cash to pay people and not have to give them equity anymore, so you can freeze the equity. And the next, next one is a large uh, theoretical base value. The larger your theoretical base value gets, the, you've reached a point of diminishing returns. And you mentioned earlier that um, the risk goes down as you go forward. The reward always goes, also goes down. So the first month, you might work 10 hours. That could be worth half the company. In your 12th month, you could work 10 hours. It could be worth 1% of the company. So it automatically adjusts uh, as time goes by the incremental hours are worth less and less. So early hours are worth more to the company. So that's how a dynamic equity split works, and it, and it keeps everything fair and square for the participants. This is a, a concept that's not widely used today because it's not widely understood. Um, there have been some, some interesting research that's been out in the past year or so showing that about 70% of entrepreneurs make the potentially fatal mistake of dividing up equity early on in their company using a fixed model. It's extremely devastating, and, and people just deal with it today because that's the only way people deal with it. They don't know how to do it. There's no, there's no uh, practical guide for implementing dynamic split. As you can see, there's a lot of moving parts. So I wrote uh, Slicing Pie as a way to provide guidance on a practical way to implement a very, very important uh, tool for keeping your company happy and fair and keeping you focused on the vision of your company and not on infighting and, uh, you know, fights you could potentially have on your team. So if you aren't using a dynamic split, whether or not you use the slicing pie model or not, I highly recommend giving it full attention until you understand it well enough to make a decision on your own. People who go the fixed split model um, really dig some major holes that many of them cannot dig out of. And I see that all the time with my students. I see all the time uh, in the companies that I help start. Um, if, they, if they've done a fixed model, it always, without exception, creates tension among the founders. So Please take a special, uh, uh, pay a special attention to how these models work. And if the grunt fund model isn't the one for you, um, then you can advise your own. But, but definitely use a dynamic split in your company, no matter what you're trying to do. Um, and you can reach me at slicingpie.com. Uh, my Twitter is grunt funds, and uh, on my website I have a lot of resources. I have a calculator, or spreadsheet that you can use to calculate the equity going forward. Um, I have examples of how it works and uh, some videos on, on how to make the thing all work together. So um, it's a very uh, diplomatic program, and my experience since I came out with these, this concept has been pretty overwhelming uh, uh, acceptance. Um, startup companies all over the world have been using this to their success.